He was a man of vision, a man of logic, a truly original thinker who possessed an extraordinary mind and a remarkable will. Alan Matheson Turing saw things in entirely new ways and created a theoretical machine that altered the course of human history. He displayed, even as a boy, an exceptional inclination for mathematics and a passion for the discipline of distance running. A graduate of King's College, Cambridge, with honors, he was elected a fellow at the age of 22. In 1936, he launched the modern computer era with his classic paper on computable numbers, in which he conceived an amazingly simple device that captured the notion of what it meant to compute. He then proved that his universal Turing machine could compute anything that was computable. During World War II, working in secret at the Government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park, he co-designed an electromechanical computing device known as the bomb. His team of code breakers then used it to successfully crack the complex Enigma codes used by the German Navy to strangle Allied shipping lanes. In 1945, Turing led the team that designed the Automatic Computing Engine, or ACE, an important early electronic digital computer. In 1946, he presented a paper that contained the first detailed design of a stored program computer. But perhaps his greatest accomplishment came in 1950 while on the faculty at the University of Manchester. There he published Computing, Machinery and Intelligence. In it, he developed the criterion, now known as the Turing test, to determine whether or not a machine could actually think. His ideas in this experiment are now widely acknowledged as the foundation for artificial intelligence. That paper concluded with a prophetic observation. We can only see a short distance ahead, Turing wrote, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. This has become the quest of an extraordinary group of mathematicians and scientists, pioneers in computing, who in just a few decades, literally a digital blink of an eye, have advanced the cultural transformation first envisioned by Alan Matheson Turing. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the entire Association for Computing Machinery, welcome to the ACM Turing Centenary Celebration. Two years ago, ACM began discussing how we should celebrate and acknowledge the centenary of Alan Turing's birth. After a lot of thought, we decided to center the ACM celebration of this special occasion on our most visible relationship with Turing, the ACM Turing Award and its winners. A year ago, March, I wrote to essentially all living Turing Award winners outlining our ideas and asking if they would be willing to participate. The response was overwhelming. Within two weeks, I had commitments from over 30 Turing Award winners to join in this special occasion. And I thank the 32 Turing Award winners with us today for following through on that commitment and being a part of the ACM Turing Centenary Celebration. I also want to thank the ACM Council and the ACM SIGs for agreeing to sponsor and financially support the ACM Turing Celebration. I particularly want to recognize 11 of our 37 SIGs, SIG ACT, SIG ARCH, SIG CHI, SIG COM, SIG DA, SIG GRAPH, SIG IR, SIG MOD, SIG OPS, and SIG PLAN, and SIG SOFT, for helping build the organizing committee for this event and taking responsibility for ensuring this day and a half is indeed something special. I also want to acknowledge and thank Google, Microsoft, and Intel for sponsoring the Student Scholarship Program that has enabled nearly 70 students from around the world to attend this event. If you see an individual with a student scholar ribbon on their badge, uh, say hello and get to know them. My acknowledgments of support for the Turing celebration would not be complete without thanking the ACM headquarters staff for their incredible effort over the past several months to support every dimension of logistics for this event. They're an awesome team and I really do thank them. And finally, I actually want to acknowledge Gene Ferraro of Ferraro Communications Limited for his effort in producing the Turing Celebration. Gene has worked with ACM for over a decade. He knows ACM, he knows Turing, he knows the Turing Award well, 
and has a unique sense and understanding of ACM and what it is we want to accomplish with an event like this. So thank you, Gene. Before we move on, I want to report on a new annual event focused on the ACM Turing Award. Last month, ACM, along with the International Mathematics Union and the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, signed an agreement with the Klaus Schirra Foundation and the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies to form a new meeting modeled after the Lindau Forum for Nobel Laureates. This new meeting will be called the Heidelberg Laureates Forum, uh, and it will bring together winners of the ACM Turing Award, the Fields Medal, and the Abel Prize to meet with young researchers from around the world for a week each fall. The first Heidelberg Forum will be held in September 2013, Andres Reuters of the Heidelberg Institute is with us, and uh, if you have any thoughts or questions about the, this new forum, talk to him or talk to me. I believe the new Heidelberg Forum focused on Turing fields and Abel laureates will significantly help our ongoing effort to raise the visibility and stature of Alan Turing and the ACM Turing Award. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Vint Cerf. Vint is the chief internet evangelist at Google, the, the president-elect of the ACM, and the general chair of the ACM Turing Centenary Celebration. Dan? Oh, I have to admit, I have to wear these damn things now to read anything. Distinguished Turing Award winners, fellows and distinguished members of the ACM, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome you to this centenary celebration of the birth of Alan M. Turing. This is a historic occasion. Never in the history of ACM have so many of our most distinguished and honored awardees come together to share their thoughts with the participants and with one another. The Alan M. Turing Award is the highest recognition offered by ACM, and we will have the great pleasure of honoring a new Turing Award winner tomorrow night, along with many other honorees, during the ACM Awards celebration. Today, however, we celebrate Turing's wide-ranging contributions to our field and, looked, and look from the past towards the future of our discipline. We will learn about Turing the man, about Turing the scientist and visionary. We will learn from our colleagues how they now see the future of computer science evolving as the 21st century unfolds and how computer science itself will largely shape the next century. It would be hard to overstate the profound impact that Turing has had on our profession. I was surprised to learn that Turing's design for the automated computing, autom automatic computing engine, which was authored at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK in February of 1946, found its way into the design of the Bendix G15 computer. That machine was the first I had the opportunity to program at UCLA while still a high school student in Van Nuys, California. Even the legendary John von Neumann, whose design for the Edvac computer was revealed at the end of June 1945, praised Turing's work as the more complete. Turing's work on computability, decidability, cryptography, artificial intelligence, among other things, set high bars and challenging targets for his colleagues and successors in our discipline. From the perspective of the technology of the 1940s and 50s, it would have been hard to extrapolate the world of 2012. But Turing's most fundamental work, for example, the invention of the universal Turing machine, opened up avenues for thinking about complexity and computability. Turing is commonly known for his innovative and critically important role in the breaking of the Enigma cryptographic codes at Bletchley Park. This was an extraordinary effort by a dedicated team that was given a very big boost from the Polish codebreakers before the outbreak of World War II. Turing contributed greatly to the design of the bomb that replicated the operation of the Enigma machines with their multiple encrypting rotors. What sets Turing apart from so many who have contributed greatly to computer science is the breadth of his interests and contributions. This centenary celebration draws on the work of many who have followed Turing and his contemporaries and who have explored more deeply paths that his early work opened to view. I cannot imagine a more fitting memorial and celebration than to look on Turing's work and to explore together that which lies ahead. 
To set us off on that journey, it's my pleasure to acknowledge the hard work of the program committee, co-chaired by Mike Schroeder, John Thomas, and Moshe Vardy, aided by the remarkable John White, who assembled the richly diverse program for the next day and a half. To guide us through the forest of ideas spawned by Turing's work is our MC, Paul Sappho. Educated at Harvard, Cambridge, and Stanford, Paul is a consulting professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford and spent two decades at the Institute for the Future until 2008. Sometimes billed as a futurist, Paul is actually well grounded in reality, but capable of seeing and more important, articulating potential futures. I've known him for many years and have always come away from my interactions with him with profound appreciation for his insights and a strong sense that the future is ours to invent. Please welcome Paul Sappho to the stage. You know, Vint, just building on your comments, as a forecaster, one of the heuristics I follow is always look back twice as far as you're looking forward. And so I think a centenary is a perfect occasion for all of us to acknowledge that while this revolution is, you know, 50, 60 years old, it's, it's barely getting started. And this is a perfect occasion for us to all be saying, what are the next big challenges? Who are the people who needed to be supported? And what are the new frontiers, no? So it's, uh, it's absolutely true that looking back helps uh, when you're trying to look forward. Although I have to say, if I go back 20 years ago and try to figure out what's going to happen from in 10 years from now, I have a great deal of difficulty with that. Some uh, people, Vince, Vin, Vint is also fond, uh, he's this kind of guy, I'm not real good at pool, but I like to play for money. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Uh, so I, actually, though, many people have the impression that inventions happen because one person comes up with an idea. And I'm inclined to think otherwise. I think that these inventions often occur in multiple uh, streams simultaneously when conditions are right for them to actually happen. And so looking at the conditions now, what do they make possible, could lead to a variety of inventions in the future. Absolutely. I think it's the right person at the right moment and the, the, we all see it in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, you never heard of an idea before and six business plans drop on your desk at the same time on the same day. Um, but there's still a magic in the individual and I think that's what is extraordinary about Turing, that the right individual dropping in at the right moment. So you think that there's some guy in a garage somewhere that's about to invent something that's gonna change the world again? No, we've already invented everything, it's all over. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's an important thing for us all to think about. I mean, when I think of Turing's life, which was quite extraordinary, but also cut short because of deep tragedy and misunderstanding, is we should not just be thinking about the ideas and the technologies that lie ahead, but who are the people? Who are the, the people who don't fit in, who don't, aren't quite understood, who haven't, you know, in, in the computer industry, if you really, if you don't fit in, you know, you sort of don't fit in, if you really rise to the level of totally not fitting in, you get a Turing Award. Um, <laughs> and then you're safe, and you can be as eccentric as you want. But I, th I think we've just been insulted, uh, but anyway, that's fine. <laughs> but I think that we all need to think about the people as well as the ideas and the technology. So that leads me to wonder, where are all the hidden garages that we aren't seeing right now? And I guess one way to find out would be to send out a tweet. So why don't we just do that? Perfect. And I'll leave it to you, Paul, to lead us through the next day oh, and a half. Thank, Thank you. you. So this is an unaccustomed position for me to be a moderator since I don't have a moderate bone in my body. Um, but uh, here is the brief for the next two days. We have an absolutely packed schedule. So we want to run this thing like a Shinkansen, not like a software development program. <laughs> Which means uh, we're going to absolutely run on time, pay attention to the time in the agendas, and make sure you come back from breaks and, and lunch quickly. Uh, and then also in that spirit, we're going to um, uh, really focus on content. So uh, I have asked the moderators to keep introductions to 
you know, the Jack Friday absolute minimum, just the facts, keep it brief so we can get into the conversations. That's why you all have an official program. In the unlikely event you don't recognize someone who is on stage, you can look them up in here. But our goal is to get to content as quickly as possible. We also want to make this interactive. So we have uh, the, the Twitter feed where you can put up comments. Also, if you want to put up questions, we have a team down here of screeners who are reading the Twitter feed, and they're going to be pulling out questions to send up to the moderators and the like. And in addition, um, our, our volunteer runners, can you all s just sort of step forward a little bit and raise your hands, and you know, the, the, these gentle folk in black t-shirts, and they're holding in their hand a punch card, or a punch card facsimile. <laughs> Don't take these home for, to run on your UNIVAC. Um, but these are for you to write questions on. And, and during the sessions, as you write questions on them, raise your hand. The runners will pick them up. They're going to bring them up to a team here that will be screening and sorting them and passing them up to the, uh, to the moderators. We obviously are not going to get to absolutely every question, but I think you'll find that the moderators will do a really terrific job of, um, of getting them up to uh, up, uh, up into the discussion. And then in addition, uh, the, the question cards and the tweets are all going to be saved and archived as part of the record of the meeting and as part of the discussion. So even if your question doesn't get answered directly, it uh, will definitely be part of the record. And I am sure people 50 years from now will be looking over those questions and having discussions. So now, without further ado, let us proceed. I want to invite uh, Keith Van Reisbergen to the stage. Keith is our moderator of the first session on Turing the Man. Come on up, Keith, and let's bring your panelists up as well, and let's give them a hand as they come to the stage. I think we just lost the panelists. Hello. Yeah, the floor is yours. And the that's the queuing device. It's for you. You're going to be the first. Ladies device. first. No, no, so you can just sit. You want to sit? Can do it or stand? You can just sit. Yeah. Okay. I'll wait till I've finished the introduction. Are we all complete? That's it. Right. So I just press uh, next. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'll be brief. Since we're, as was said, there's a tight schedule. Excuse me for looking at my notes because I'm still quite jet lagged. So this panel is slightly different from the following panels. Um, it's more concerned with Turing as a person, as a man, and so it won't uh, necessarily uh, concentrate on his technical uh, achievements. Uh, it'll be more about you know who he was, where he was, and so on. So it'll emerge as we get to the panelists. Um, what I propose to do is to very, very, very briefly introduce each panelist. Uh, and of course, you can consult the program for a more detailed introduction. And the detail is quite good. And incidentally, they also all have entries on the Wikipedia, where there's a lot more detail with each, each, each panelist. Um, so the thing that I wanted to emphasize is that the, the, this particular uh, panel, panel, maybe the others too, is more in the way of a discussion and so you are really invited to jump in after each panelist has introduced their, their, their few comments with questions or comments. So it's meant to be a kind of a, 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 a conversation. Um, so let me introduce the panelists. Now, the first, the first panelist is William Newman, to my left. And um, he is a, um, a researcher, a long-term researcher. He was at Xerox and Cambridge and in Palo Alto. And now, he has an un unusual association with, with Turing. Uh, perhaps I can illustrate it. There, there is a book written by Turing's mother called Sarah Turing. Uh, and in fact, what's written in that book that I'm about to, to tell you about was also reproduced in Andrew Hodges' book on, on, uh, on Turing. And it goes something like this. So um, the, one of her children, one of her sons, or Max Newman's son, sorry, um, is uh, about to have a birthday party. And he's uh, asked, you know, who is coming to your birthday party? And this son says, 
Well, um, six boys from school and one bachelor. Now, the bachelor turned out to be uh, Alan Turing, and the son is William Newman. So you can see there's an early association with uh, Alan Turing there. Uh, Kelly Gottlieb, an extremely distinguished professor uh, at Toronto uh, University. Has the mic gone off or something? It sounds odd to me. No? OK. Um, and uh, the, the thing I remember uh, is when I was a, a sort of junior re research scientist, I remember him very well as the editor of the Journal of the ACN. Um, the next person who's going to say a few things is Charlie Backman, uh, who, as you know, has one of the ACM Turing Awards. Um, he's an industrial researcher. In other words, he's spent most of his time in industry. And in fact, again, I remember him from a long time ago when in 1978 he wrote a commentary on the Codicil report, one of the databases. And finally, Wendy Hall, uh, who is a Dane. Now, that's a tautology in the States, I understand that. But in the UK, <laughs> it's actually quite significant. So, <laughs> um, she's, she was president of the ACM and uh, is still professor of, at Southampton. And in fact, she's the co-founder of quite an important uh, initiative in web science, uh, which she co-founded with, amongst others, Berners-Lee. And finally, there's myself, I'm Keith van Reisbergen, and I sort of got interested in Turing in about 1977 when I approached my, uh, my college, in fact, the library in my college, which is King's College, the same college as Turing, and wanted to do a lot of work on his unpublished papers and had them transferred from Oxford to Cambridge. And since that time, I've always been interested in the, the things that go around about Turing. One of the things I want to say, and I think one of the panelists will probably agree with me, but in the 70s, although Turing now has this fame and is known by everybody, in the 70s he really wasn't very well known at all. Right? There were very few people. If you ask people, do you know Turing? And they sort of go, oh, and they'd say, oh, you mean the person who did the Turing machine? And they'd say, yes, okay, but there was a bit more. But he's now become extremely famous, as you're all aware. So I'll pass you over to William. Would you like to say a few things about your presentation in the slides? Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I'm very uh, t glad to be here. It's really an enormous honor to be, uh, to, to, to be invited. And as far as I know, my, my acquaintance with Alan Turing is the only thing that qualifies me. Uh, and so uh, I'll try and pick out just a few points. Um, I, I've, in, try in thinking back, I've found it helpful to try and sort of depict some of the events of uh, my life as it overlapped Alan's. And if I could show the first slide. Um, well, I can talk to the slide even if it's Here not it comes. there. <laughs> oh, there it is. Uh, I think my, f my, f my first memory is of uh, early one morning uh, waking up to the sound of somebody at the front door and getting up and finding that it was Alan. Uh, and he'd run all the way from his house and on the way had realized that he wanted to invite us to supper, didn't have pen or paper, and so was scratching the invitation on a rhododendron leaf. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, the next slide. Uh, well, well, when we sort of, he, he was always uh, uh, visiting us since he lived so close and uh, one of the things he, he did was to ask if, well, uh, would I like to play a game of chess with him where he would be blindfolded essentially sitting out where he couldn't see the board telling me his moves and I told him my moves. And uh, we played away and I began to feel rather threatened by this. Um, <laughs> and uh, eventually Alan excused himself. He said he got up and, and went out of the room. Uh, and my father, who'd been sitting there, leant across and pointed to how Alan's, um, Alan's queen could move into a checkmate position. <laughs> and so we, we waited, and eventually Alan returned. And I think he had actually been trying to bring himself to beat me at chess because he knew I would be terribly upset and probably burst into tears. 
But he did come back and do the right thing, which was to end the game with his movie. <laughs> so, um, so the the uh, the, the uh, where have I got to in my slides? Um, one other thing that uh, I can remember is that he asked me one day, did we have a Monopoly board so that we could play Monopoly? Um, and I, I said, uh, well, I think he'd looked around the house and hadn't been able to see one. And I think he was probably planning to give us one. And so it wasn't um, anything but uh, sort of feeling out the situation. And I said, no. Um, uh, but I said, oh, actually, I've drawn a Monopoly set. Um, so the next slide, I think, shows it. And uh, this was my uh, solution to the problem that we didn't have one at the time, and uh, it only differed really in having this diagonal. But I said, yes, we do have a monopoly board, and uh, do come and play. And I'm afraid Alan just lost uh, totally. Uh, um, uh, you know, all, all his money got spent, and, and my brother and I won hands down. But uh, the final bit of my, um, my introduction here is just to say that this board you know, in, in all the years that went by, disappeared until last year when I paid a visit to the home where I was born and where we lived. And the man who has bought the house handed me a folder and said, I think this must be yours. And there was the Monopoly set, uh, as you saw there, sitting on there. And uh, I'm glad to say it's now in better hands. It's gone to Bletchley Park. So. I have to say that uh, Alan was a wonderful friend, and, and in talking to his nieces, Ina Payne and, and, and Janet uh, Robinson, I began to realize that what I was experiencing was having an uncle uh, who did all the things that uncles should and all the things that they shouldn't. And uh, I, I had only two uncles at the time. One lived in Africa, one lived in South America. Alan was my local uncle. Thank you. Thank you, William. Would you pass on? I don't think you've had that. Hello, would you like to speak, Kelly? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll start by saying how I came to uh, meet Turing. Uh, when when uh, ENIAC was announced uh, shortly after the war, it had, been, it had been working during the war on the atomic bomb, but it was kept secret. When it was announced, I think it was 1947, uh, about then, and uh, universities all around the world, uh, and certainly in the United States and England and Canada, started designing machines. Uh, and, um, but we didn't get them to work for quite a long time. And in 1951, um, a machine that was being built at the University uh, at Manchester by Ferranti became available for sale. Um, because a labor government was elected in England and they canceled all contracts over a hundred thousand pounds and suddenly the machine that was almost ready for delivery became available and uh, at the we got money from the University of Toronto in fact they had given us money to design a machine it was in the bank actually and we decided uh, to purchase this Manchester machine uh, which we call fair for anti UT, um, and um, it was delivered in 1951. Uh, but in April, and it was delivered in September. In April, uh, I was uh, at that time in charge of the computing project for designing okay. machine, and I was uh, sent to Manchester Sorry. for six weeks to learn how to program what? the Manchester machine, which was designed by. Uh, Tom uh, Kilburn um, and uh, Freddie Williams. Um, and uh, so I spent six weeks there. And um, the Manchester machine, uh, the one we were getting, was modeled after a working machine at Manchester. And Turing, uh, that machine was a vacuum tube, it had 10,000 vacuum tubes in it. It wasn't very reliable. So it needed a lot of maintenance, and generally uh, the engineers did maintenance at night, and and mathematicians worked at it during the daytime. If the if it didn't need engineers, Turing was there at night to work. 
So he was there all night, usually, every night, uh, to, to do his work on the machine. When I'd come in in the morning, I'd meet Turing, and I had several talks with him. And, if, and, and of course, I asked him what he was working on, and I remember well, he said, oh, I'm designing a four-leaf clover. Well, that kind of puzzled me, and I asked around a bit, and it turned out that what he was doing, he was uh, solving a second uh, nonlinear differential equation, um, which was essentially um, uh, doing for, um, uh, with, with, modeling, uh, with modeling events that, uh, that uh, were very unusual. And, um, you know, uh, uh, so he was trying to solve on the, the second, this nonlinear differential equation, which he did eventually solve. Now, what I found out later was that um, this essentially was a mo model um, uh, for um, uh, uh, the difference between a nonlinear differential equation and, a, and a, an ordinary linear differential equation is quite important. In an ordinary differential equation, you get a general solution, and then the initial condition, which has in it perhaps uh, usually a couple of unknowns, and the initial conditions determine these unknowns, these constants, and they don't really change the, the, the nature of the solution by very much. The, the, main, the main character of the solution is not affected by the initial conditions. But it turns out uh, on a nonlinear differential equation, the initial conditions can make dramatic changes on the solution. And, and, uh, and it's also used, in, incidentally, uh, to model chaos theory. For example, for weather conditions, and that's why in chaos theory they say a, a butterfly flaps its wings in, in Indonesia and makes a storm in Brazil, um, just from the initial conditions. So these nonlinear differential equations are very different than linear ones, and Turing was the first one to do that. And incidentally, one day when I was giving, listening to a lecture in chemistry, uh, we in computers think of Turing contribution to computing, but they regard him as the father of chaos, chaos theory. And, and it, it just shows how multiple his, his, his uh, contributions are. Well, I had, I had several conversations, several times I'd come in and speak to Turing. The other, other thing he did on, uh, was important for computing, was that he knew it was important to, to have man-computer communication. And, and the Manchester machine, uh, the, the I.O., the input, was a punch paper tape, uh, uh, teletype, with teletype characters on it. So Turing kind of designed a language um, in which, uh, which used teletype characters, and they had five bits on them. Um, and, 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 uh, and when you look at, when you're programming this Manchester machine, you look at this cathode ray tube screen, and, they, and the uh, um, words were in group five bits at a time. You'd look at them, and you'd have to read them out. So Turing, Turing assigned uh, letters to them, so stroke was five zeros, and at was four zeros one, and um, A, letter A, was uh, four zeros one one, and, and so on stroke E at and so on. And so he would look at the machine and, and, and read out the teletype characters on it. Um, and, and essentially you did the binary conversion, hexadecimal conversion on it. It was very natural for him. Uh, and that's the language that we got with the Manchester machine. Well, very, after we got it very early, we started doing decimal machines and produced a, a, a kind of pre-Fortran uh, version so we could, we could talk to the machine using decimal languages and, 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 and uh, ordinary arithmetic on it. But Turing, uh, you know, he, did, he didn't need, 
he didn't need a decimal conversion. I mean, in his mind, he just converted hexadecimal to decimal without hardly thinking about it and left it for us to figure out a better way to, to deal with it. That's pretty good, yeah. So, uh, Turing, you know, the more, the more you hear about him, the more you realize how, many, how multiple his contributions were. Thank you. I think you need to press a, a button called next slide. You, is that all right? Charlie? Yeah. You heard it from me? Yeah. yeah. Is it on? Can yeah. you hear me? Well, my acquaintance with Alan Turing and the Turing Award almost came as a surprise to me. Coming out of the engineering world, the manufacturing world, you didn't get too close to mathematicians, and mechanical engineers don't get as much mathematics as the electrical engineers do. So. When I got a phone call early in 1973 announcing that I was won a Turing Award, I had to quickly check and find out what that was <laughs> and uh, find out more about this man Turing. My wife, being a very astute person, went to the Boston Public Library and see, to see what they had on Alan Turing. And there, in fact, was one book in the library. In fact, what you see is the fly sheet of this book, a little book that Mrs. Turing, Sarah Turing, wrote about her son. And in this fascinating book, one of the things you find out is that mothers can have an enormous influence on their children. And Alan was a difficult child, as she said at times, but also one who was very precocious. And she kept a remarkable record of all the things he did, he said, he wrote. And looking back into the, you know, the kindergarten age, there were things he had done when he went to first preparatory school as a very young boy. He, all the letters he wrote still seem to be in her hand when she got around to write this book. Later on, when he went to Sherburne School as a public school, which is a, our high school at level, more things, and on when he was in the Cambridge book letter. So she had this tremendous collection of correspondence with him and, of, and, and, and an enormous memory of other events. So she set out to say, well, somebody at some day is going to want to write a real biography about Alan, and I'll collect all the facts for them. And so this is exactly what this book is. This is supposed to be a primer for the next big book on Alan Turing. And it's quite remarkable. Well, when Connie found this book in the library in Boston, she wrote to Heifer, the company in England who was the publishers, and got in touch with Mr. Heifer. And he said, oh yes, we have a few copies left. And they're 23 shillings each, which is about two and a half dollars at that time. And but so uh, he, my, Connie ordered a couple of copies for us. I still, one of them survived. I borrowed back from my daughter, Sarah. I'm not quite sure where the other one went to. But the interesting thing, he also mentioned, Mr. Heffer, that Sarah Turing, Alan's mother, was alive and well, living in Guildford, Surrey in England, and gave the address there, and my wife, Sent, him up, sent her off a letter to see what, how she was doing. And we got several letters back, which I have copies of, written in this lovely script, beautifully written by a 92-year-old lady. First of all, saying, what is this Turing Award? <laughs> which, which she did not know. And uh, can you tell me something about this ACM? Which she did not know. Well, in the period of time from 1973 when the award was given, I happened to be in the UK on a business trip for Honeywell, who I was working for at that time, and also for a meeting which coincided with it by plan. 
with the BCS, the British Computer Society, and we had a free Saturday in that schedule. And said, well, let's go to down to Guildford and let's see if we can find Mrs. Turing. And so we got on the train and went down and went to the address of this nursing home and they invi invited us into her room and she was sitting in a chair, this is a very bright lady, bright eyed, smiling. And so we spent the afternoon chatting with her. And in fact, we got a picture on here. One, oh, we got the picture already? Excuse me. This book, and we have uh, somewhere around here is a paper copy of this. Why don't you stand it up in front of the ACM yeah. thing? We'll take over priority at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife with her little Minox spy camera, which is about as big as my thumb, has eight millimeter film, took a picture which you can see on the side screens and also here. And I had about a one and a half by two print from that, which we found someplace and we salvaged things and we, that was digitalized to make this picture where you see here today. But when chatting with Mrs. Turing, there was really two things that were, she was asking about what is this Turing Award again? She had not quite understood that. And she thought that maybe it was an award given to runners at her Sherburne, Sherburne school that Alan went to as a student. And she thought that was probably what it was. And I tried to explain to her one about Alan Turing's work, which I think she knew more about than I did. And the ACM was a, that time, nationally focused part of the computer world. Since then, expanded their world to think they're the computer society for the whole world, if I understand things correctly. Anyone disagree with that? <laughs> and that this award was given to the, uh, every year to the outstanding contribution to the computer science world. And she felt fairly comfortable with that. But the things that was really worrying her, she said that Alan had a lot of unfinished papers that were in his digs when he died. And um, they were given to a man who was, at that time, at the University of Edinburgh, a man named Donald Mickey. And she said, well, when is Mr. Mickey going to finish these papers up for Alan? And to the best of my knowledge, and I'd like to have someone tell me better whether those could be finished, or sometimes I think these papers that are unfinished are not finishable other than the original author himself. <laughs> so that, as I looked at this thing, what I thought is that a mother who's dedicated to her son to the extent that Sarah was dedicated to her son made a tremendous contribution to this man who was difficult in his own way but developed quite good social friends with people and became quite likable and we know he's a tremendous success. So that's my part of the story about Sarah Turing, who was a woman I really admired endlessly. Thank you. <laughs> right. Do I need to, oh, do I need to press? Right, so um, I am a miracle of modern science. I was a contemporary of Turing at King's. I just hide my age very well. <laughs> huh. Seriously, I was one when Turing died, so I never got to meet him. But my career has been interestingly interwoven with his legacy, which is what I want to talk about this morning. Um, this is the OBE, that's the officer of the British Empire. Um, that Turing was secretly awarded after the war. And this is what Keith was alluding to earlier, is that Turing and, his, and the people at Bletchley Park are now credited with saving millions of lives in World War II because of the work they did there. But it was incredibly secret. And in fact, there are still papers today that cannot be released because they are still held by our government as top secret papers because of their importance. And it was only in the, so the recognition of the team at Bletchley Park 
really is only just emerging. Um, Turing was, I say, sec uh, secretly awarded um, an OBE um, for his work. He really should have had a knighthood, uh, which is the male equivalent of a dame, I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, I, uh, I think they can be awarded <laughs> posthumously. So Sue, I think this is something we should start campaigning about. I'll talk to you about Sue later. So as Sir Keith said, that the facts about Turing and the knowledge about him as a person and what he contributed to computing and to the work at Petri Park emerged very slowly after the Second World War. And on this timeline, these slides are taken from the London Science Museum's Facebook page. Um, they are having a major Turing exhibition that opens next week and runs for a year. They have an, they have an enig Enigma machine, they have an ACE computer, they have a huge number of artifacts, many of which haven't been seen in public before, um, about Turing. So, and it's open for a year, so if you're in London, any time, don't come in August, but any other time <laughs> um, uh, over the next year, go to the Science Museum and look at the Turing exhibition. This is the um, Enigma machine, and we, um, as, the, as, the, as the public, began to hear about this work in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it was around that, well, it wasn't that time, it was in the 1990s that um, I was uh, doing a lot of stuff with Keith in the British Computer Society, and he, as he said, got very interested in the Turing archives, and I was very interested in digital uh, information, which in the 1990s was still quite science fiction, marvelous okay. as it seems. And we set up a project that was funded by the BCS and the IE, the Institute of Electrical Engineers and the University of Southampton um, to digitize the Turing archives that are held by King's College Cambridge. And you can go, it's still all on the web, and all the papers that were held are held by King's College, all his working manuscripts. You can see them online. Uh, that's the index. You won't be able to read it, but there are three items there very relevant to here. There's an item marked um, Association of Computing Machinery, an item marked Charles Barkman, and an item marked A.M. Turing Award. They all point to the same letter. This is the letter that you wrote to Sarah, Ch no, to, actually to Joe Cunningham, who was the chief, is that, I've got the right name, I can't read it, the chief executive of the ACM at the time, you wrote this letter about the request from Sarah Turing to find out more about the ACM and the ACM Turing Award. And in particular, you say, could Joe write to Sarah and tell her who the 1974 recipient, wit, recipient was? Which, of course, Donald Knuth, who's somewhere in the audience, haven't seen him yet. So that's uh, an interesting connection to what you were saying. And it was um, a fantastic privilege for me to uh, be involved in that project and in particular to find out the things he did, I mean, the mathematical biology work that he did towards the end of his life. Um, he, would have, he is still a major contributor to that field. Um, and he, uh, just think what else he would have done if he had lived longer. So this is my final slide. Um, the recognition for Turing has built up considerably as we've approached this 100th anniversary. This is the statue of him at Bletchley Park, um, which is, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. The other thing is the um, apology that was issued by our Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, in 2009, under pressure from the community as a public apology in the House of Commons for the way he was treated, uh, a war hero treated the way we did. Um, he uh, couldn't be pardoned because he did actually commit a crime as the laws were at the time, but um, we have the public apology and there are a number of campaigns going to uh, uh, try and get him on a £10 note or uh, other recognition. I say I think we should go for a posthumous knighthood. One of the chief campaigners and the person, one of the people who saved Bletchley Park is Sue Black who's sitting down here, the lady with red hair. Uh, she's a Twitterer par excellence, and the Save Bletchley Park campaign is one of the first examples of a campaign that uh, uh, was won on Twitter, which of course only exists because we have computers. Um, and uh, the amazing thing was that the government wanted to pull Bletchley Park down. 
the previous, uh, I think the Labour government before, because they wanted to build social housing there. Um, and, you know, they, it was a really serious threat to losing that. And now it's, um, uh, it, hopefully it is saved and it is becoming our, one, a central showpiece in the UK to honour the people who worked at Bletchley Park. And now here we are at the 100th anniversary, um, this wonderful event here in, um, in San Francisco. Um, we started talking about this when I was president of the ACM, and uh, I want to add my thanks to John's, to the, the ACM staff who've worked so hard to make this happen. Um, there are, of course, um, this event is this weekend because next weekend is the anniversary, and there are several events in, in England, one at Cambridge and one at Manchester, and a number of Turing Award winners will be there. So um, there's a series of events, and we will continue to uh, mark his name. I think the amazing thing is that I'm talking here about slides from, well, they've gone now, but the, the uh, Facebook timeline from the Science Museum and talking about Twitter saving Bletchley Park. This, to me, is a new phenomenon of um, what Tim Berners-Lee um, called in his book, Weaving the Web, social machines. This is, this is not, uh, the Turing test applies to a person comparing a person and a machine. Um, social machines are about machines and people, society working together. The web, Google, Facebook, Twitter are all social machines. And I think it's fascinating going forward to think about uh, uh, how, how these machines are created and uh, are working uh, from Turing's work on Turing machines to think about the machines we're building today as, um, as a social technical enterprise. That's me. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Well, we've, we've got some, uh, we'll move on to questions and comments. We've got some quite interesting questions here. One of the questions I, I have here is for to ask if any of the Turing Award winners in, in the audience uh, met or knew of Turing. Are there any in the, the audience who... Anybody there? Because we certainly would like you to invite you to make a comment if you did meet Turing or you knew him quite well. No? There's a zero show of hands. I'm having difficulty seeing because of the lights, so I can't... Um, Somebody else will have to, to look. It doesn't look like it. Yeah? Because, no. Okay. So the, the other question, which is, again, is, a, is a, um, a general question. So basically, if well, I said in, in the brief presentation uh, earlier on that uh, when I started getting interested in, in Turing in the, in the mid-70s, um, I used to ask around people and, and basically asked around, I suppose, in, uh, in the computer laboratory in Cambridge, in, in England. And I, most people that I spoke to knew very little about Turing. In my college, on the other hand, there were a number of people who had worked at Bletchley Park with Turing, but they were non-mathematicians and non-computer scientists. And so um, they just remembered him as an, an associate at, at Bletchley Park. So the question then arises, and I tried to find out about this earlier on today, is if generally Turing, and this I'm certainly talking about Britain now, but if Turing generally was not known uh, in the 70s or even earlier in the 60s, excuse me, uh, how come the ACM had the foresight to set up the award? Which is an interesting question. I mean, how did that happen? Does anybody know right, who initiated the award within the ACM. Yeah, I think you, I can would you, help there. Yeah, please. Uh, w very early, of course, because of Turing posed, posed the question, when can a machine think? And um, I think more people know the Turing test here. Mm. Essentially, if you can have a conversation with something in the next room, and after an hour you don't know whether that's something of a man or a machine, then and if it was a machine, it can think. So. Um, very early in computers, I remember when we got, when we were still building, before we got the machine, we had a big newspaper article about the machine we were trying to design, and they call it the thinking machine. Mm. So uh, artificial intelligence was a very uh, early um, 
concentration on computers and 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 the, whether a machine could think or not um, uh, was, was, was caught the public eye and and the early computers were called thinking machines now the the machine we got at the university was we paid five hundred thousand dollars and filled a room about half this side, 10,000 vacuum tube, and it had about one millionth the capacity of your iPhone. Um, yes. <laughs> so, and, 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 and yet, I have, I have newspaper articles talking about the thinking machine. So, the Turing test of, of, and the idea of a thinking machine caught the public eye very early. So can you put a name on the person within, or persons within the ACM who um, proposed the award? No, I, I can't. Because I, it seems to be I, lost. I might say, incidentally, that uh, on Turing recommendation, I hired one of his graduate students and brought them back with me to Toronto. So I... Who was I, that? Yes, who was that? Pardon? Who was the graduate student? Um, I, I'm sorry, I've got a 91-year-old The only, the only one I know was Robin I'll Gandhi. Think, I'll think of it shortly. <laughs> Robin Gandhi. It wasn't but Robin he, Gandhi. He worked with us for several years, and then he went joined the team that designed the Avro Arrow, which is a famous right. airplane, um, uh, the really uh, 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 a very fast airplane that was designed in Canada and, and, and got working but never went into production. Mm. So uh, his name was Peter, um, I'll, I'll think of his last right. name in a moment. Peter? So I brought, I brought him back with me in Canada and, yeah. and yeah. To, yeah. to work with us in the mansion. So there is certainly a difference between his recognition at this sort of public and level uh, between the US and, and the UK. Uh, I think the explanation partly in the UK is that the, the sort of, the, the field was dominated by the people who built the machine and got them going in the first instance, like the people in Manchester and the people in Cambridge, so for example, mm -hmm. Morris Wilkes. And there was also, and this is quite, I mean, it's a difficult thing to discuss because you, know, you never know what the real truth is, but there was antipathy towards Turing in the actual making of machines. So for example, it's well known in Britain that Morris Wilkes and Alan Turing did not get on. And it yeah. actually held back, in my opinion, the developments of computing. So there is a kind of an explanation why, if you like, he uh, lacked the kind of recognition. What I'm not sure about <coughs> is, is what really happened in the States. Uh, but nevertheless, I got the overall opinion that his, his recognition was very slow to emerge. So it would be quite interesting to know uh, who the people were that um, you know, proposed his name. Is, is Dana well, Scott in the audience? He, because people, he's on one of the panels. He might know. People so did know that Turing... Right? Yeah, uh, there's a microphone. Is roaming. Can you name your name, please? Right. You're in the room. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you see? Okay. Why, walk over here. I'll give you my, my lab mic. Oh, now it's working. Somebody Try else on. <laughs> Seems the technology hasn't moved on very much. <laughs> We're all prisoners of technology. I only came online in the mid-50s, but here in the States there was a lot of work in logic, recursive function theory. Stephen Cole Claney, Church's student, was very instrumental because of his development of the technology of recursive function theory. And he always uh, credited Turing and the Turing machine and all many, very, very many students learned about Turing machines 
through his work and other people like that. And so logic and recursive function Sorry. theory brought Turing's name quite to prominence. So that's to what? my, to my view. Okay. So Donald Knuth, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't see you very well, but you want to add, don't Donald, you? Donald, here's yeah. the mic. Yeah, I, I, can, I can second what, what, what Dana said. Uh, I'm not sure what it means coming online, but, but <laughs> we, were, we were undergraduates in, this, in, this, in the uh, 50s, and, uh, and uh, certainly we heard of the, of the abstract Turing machine. Uh, I, I remember I was editor of a, of a science magazine at, at Case Tech, and uh, one of the one of the papers that uh, that we published that year, I think, like 1959, w was about a project in the electrical engineering department to build a Turing machine, uh, and they were doing it out of relays, and uh, and, and they had a uh, uh, instead of a magnetic tape, it was a uh, it, it was to be a plastic uh, tape uh, uh, <coughs> with, with optical readers. And they would uh, they would deposit India ink on the tape in order to write bits on it, and then if you erased on the tape uh, a, a little um, uh, uh, what do you call it uh, anyway, like like ball of cotton would would come and scrub off uh, the ink. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm serious. This was <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, people knew. Uh, even in the 50s at my undergraduate college, so, you know, we were talking about a, a Turing machine. Uh, but, uh, but we didn't know about uh, any of the, of course, Bletchley Park that was all secret and so on. And uh, it was the early 60s when somebody in England wrote, a, wrote an article, uh, I don't remember who it was, but it was called The Other Turing Machine. And it talked about uh, 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 Turing's work on the, uh, on the A's. And, and that was when I first uh, uh, realized what was going on. And so I, I wrote to Mike Woodger and said, what's all this going on? And, 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 and so uh, uh, I, I got copies of, of, of things that, that Turing had written that were very uh, 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 amazing to me because he was a comp complete computer scientist. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, as you say, with, with uh, all over the map with, uh, with talents. And, well, I got the mic, I might as well say, I, I think, uh, uh, as far as I know, he's the first person in history who, who really had what we now call the mind of a geek. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I'd, I'd like to pick up one of the comments you made, the, the other Turing machine. There is another Turing machine. I used to think it was the other Turing machine. Turing machine, uh, uh, Turing designed a mechanical machine uh, for testing the Riemann hypothesis in mathematics. And in fact, there is still a design for that. Um, and the, the elements for it were actually built. And in fact, it made it possible that he built some himself. They're basically cogwheels, brass cogwheels. And if you see the movie um, that was made about Turing, it's, well, I can't remember the name, but it's probably called Enigma or something like that. When he arrives at Bletchley Park, he actually lifts a suitcase, a heavy suitcase, without opening it, onto a wardrobe. And, and the story is that he kept these cogwheels with him wherever he went. He wouldn't part with them. So when he, this is a bit of an in-joke. So when he arrives at Bletchley, the first thing he does, he picks up the suitcase and puts it on the top of the, um, the wardrobe. So that's, that I always think of the other Turing machine as actually the machine he designed to uh, test the Riemann hypothesis. Anyway, I want to pass on to the, the first Twitter that's come in. And uh, I think um, most of you will know that one of the problems that Turing ran into towards the end of his life was his homosexuality. And I think one of the people who, um, who sent this um, uh, the, the, the comment from the, from, from the, the, the audience, and I, I quite like you to respond, actually, after I had my say, is this, it, this is surely the elephant in the room. Uh, his homosexuality. Well, I don't think it is anymore, actually. I think it's been pretty well uh, openly discussed and has been for a long time. And perhaps I could make a comment. Um, in the late 70s or early 80s, I, in my college, I interviewed three people who wanted to do a biography of, uh, of Turing. And one of them was Andrew Hodges, who finally was uh, given access to the archive. And Andrew, when, he, when I interviewed him, came out quite openly. He said, 
I want to tackle the, uh, the story of Turing uh, from the point of view of a homosexual, a gay person who has been discriminated against, quite forcibly discriminated against, and so on. So he was quite open about all this, and he was given access to the archive knowing that he would address the uh, homosexuality of Turing. Now, the person who wrote the, 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 the oh, they don't, um, your name, Alan Spurtus, would you like to, would you, sorry? Would you like to comment on this? Because uh, you obviously have a slightly different view of it. Are you still in the audience? I am. Yeah. I don't know if you assumed that everybody here and everybody watching the webcast already knew about it and wanted to cover things that weren't known about, but um, talking about Alan Turing's his life, the man, um, it's the reason that uh, he wasn't around for decades more, so it seemed worth mentioning uh, for people who didn't know that part of his life. Mm -hmm. And there are still people who are persecuted. Keith? Yeah. I did allude to it because the, um, the British, there was, there was a petition to get him pardoned. He was actually, of course, tried for his homosexuality and found guilty. And he chose chemical castration over a jail sentence. Um, and that's well known, um, and it was in the, very much the subject of the play. Um, the British government refused the pardon, or in fact the law, ju the judges refused the pardon because it was, he did commit a crime as the law was in the country at the time. Of course we live in a more enlightened age now. So I did allude to that, and I think it yeah. is pretty well known, so but thank you for raising it here. Yeah. The, the other comment I would like to make is that if you read the, the story about uh, Turing in the various uh, biographies, one of the things that comes out of it is that he, he was unhappy in many places. That includes, this is from a personal point of view, not an intellectual point of view. This is uh, at Princeton, for example, and so on. But the only place where he was comfortable and happy was actually King's College, Cambridge. And in King's College, Cambridge, there is a long history of people, um, to name a few like you know, Ian Forster and so on, who were open homosexuals, uh, and um, he just felt that he was in the right company. And this is certainly, you know, the, the, there's no dispute about that. So he, he, he started his career in King's, and he, over the years he kept returning to it because he felt comfortable socially in, in the college. Um, now, maybe I should call on. So there is a question here, which is quite an interesting long-term question. I don't know who wants to tackle that. Um, so, uh, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, how would computing have changed if Alan had lived longer? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all wonder about this. And I, 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 I think of a dinner party with um, Alan Turing, Vince Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee, um, uh, just the, the sort of the great pioneers and how, how it would be, how, how, how he would view what's happening today uh, in the world of the internet and the web. Right. Well, the, uh, the other thing though is, is no one I think foresaw how many applications there would be for computing. So now, you know, whether you're, whether you're taking a degree in medicine or law or so on, if you don't know how to deal with large databases, uh, you're, you're not going to be get ahead in your field. Right. So com computing has risen beside like mathematics uh, in the same way that you have to know some of it in order to deal with whatever, whatever discipline you're dealing with. And I think this is a really dramatic change that how widespread right. uh, and, and particularly the need to deal with large databases, right. big data as, as right. it's called. Any, anybody in the audience who want to contribute to this discussion about how it might have changed? Does anybody dare to? Make, I'd like to make a comment actually. You see, what, one of the things I think might have affected um, computing considerably is um, his influence on quantum computation. Because when he left school, Turing, he was given a prize, I think it was a book token. And with that book token, uh, he bought von Neumann's book on the foundations of quantum mechanics. And he actually, obviously, studied it quite closely. 
And then over the years, he moves away from that. But towards the end of his life, he picked up the work on, uh, on quantum theory again. And it's possible that had he carried on, he would have gotten involved in the development of, of quantum computation and might have had a significant influence. Oh, sorry, yes, I can't see you, so you're going to have to do it for me. Vint has a comment. Actually, you just stole the thing I was going to raise because uh, you know, Turing did so much work on computability and now we rely very heavily in the crypto world on things that are hard to compute. So it would have been extraordinarily interesting uh, to see what uh, Turing would have made, uh, alternative computing capabilities that might in fact require us to uh, reinvent that which we now rely on for security and confidentiality. So I agree with you. It would have been fascinating to see what would have happened. Right. Well, of course, thinking about his predecessor, uh, Newton at, at King's, who went on to mess with the exchequer and dabble in um, alchemy, who knows? We might have gotten Twitter <laughs> 40 years sooner. <laughs> <laughs> Any more comments from the, the audience about this? I mean, is it, actually, I think it's a very interesting question because Just if you raise think your about hand, we had a mic to you. Go on. Uh, if you, if, you, um, if you think about also the, the last part of his career, and that's what uh, Kelly was talking about actually, he worked on uh, morphogenesis. And again, that was only beginning to, to start in, in formal terms. So if, he, if he'd lived longer, he may well have had quite a, an impact on, on, on that work of, of morphogenesis. Right, so, more questions? Well, there, there's, uh, I've done that. Okay. This one? Okay. So I'm sorry if I can't do all the questions, but I'm trying to pick them, which concentrate a little bit more on, on um, um, his, his life. Um, so this one is, uh, what is the best author? Or, there's no autobiography. <laughs> sorry, that's, you should have done I make that mistake too. Uh, what is the best, and I'm correcting your question, biography on Turing? Oh, um, so, may I answer that? Because I interviewed the guy. Um, so, um, I still think, and I've read most of the biographies now, I still think Andrew Hodges' uh, biography, it's a tome, it's a, it's a, but it's a scholarly piece of work. And in fact, the footnotes are probably the, the most interesting things to read. I still think that is by far the, the best biography of, of, of Turing, Andrew Hodges' book. And it's been out for about, I don't know, it was published in the 80s, I guess, Huggins book. and so on. So it's been around for a long it's time, but I haven't seen Hodges. anything. Hodges. Um, Hodges. 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 Okay. Andrew Hodges. Uh, I think, so he used, for example, Searing Turing's <coughs> book as she wanted it to be used as source material for a biography. Um, so has anybody read a biography of, of of Turing that they think is really outstanding. I mean, I'm sure that I've missed some of them. I mean, they like to allude to it in some way. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. was um, an, a BBC series on genius, and uh, one of the about five or six programs, and the, uh, one of the latter ones had about a 20-minute um, TV presentation of Turing. Mm. Uh, of his life and so on. So it, uh, it, it wasn't, it, it was only about 15 or 20 minutes long. Right. But, but it, it really told, it told a number of things, particularly about its life at Cambridge, that I hadn't known before I saw that. Right. Before I saw that uh, excerpt from the B BBC series on yeah. genius. Of the smaller ones, there is a French one. I can't remember the author anymore, but that's now been translated into English. It's, um, and I think that's, if you want to read a sort of a 80 or 100 page biography, the, the, it, it, it's available on the web. Uh, it, but it, the, the Frenchman did a, did a biography of, of Turing, and it's quite a good one. Um, now, I'm, I was, somebody whispered in my ear that I, that was probably the, um, um, but I think I'll take one more question because I'm, I'm reading these numbers and I guess that means that I've got two minutes and 30 seconds to go. Um, so, <laughs> so this is an interesting technical question actually. I, I'm certainly, I, I don't think I could answer it. So why isn't Turing's lambda calculus, sorry, why isn't Church's lambda calculus as famous as Turing machines? 
Does anyone want to tackle that? Because it's harder. <laughs> I don't know. Come on, Dana Scott, you well, you'll be able to, to answer that. Both and the audience. <laughs> Somebody should it's be able to. It's harder to explain. Oh, okay, okay. Let's get a mic cover here. <laughs> Did it have anything to do with the fact that Church suggested Princeton? <laughs> you see, they came out uh, simultaneously uh, to understand what general idea of computability meant. Well, actually, Alonzo Church just beat him to it, didn't he? You're being very polite. <laughs> well, Turing was working independently. Yeah. And the yeah. thing about Turing, the man, is that he always did things from first principles. Yeah. And so when it was a question of what is an algorithm, he sat down from first principles to say what it was. And that's what caught everybody's attention. Church was much more the logician and mathematician, and he formulated things in a more abstract way. And so clearly Turing's approach was much more understandable to anyone who was thinking uh, very, very basically. That's my opinion. Thank you. And well, this always happens that one minute before the end of the session, everybody in the audience wakes up and has comments. So you tell me who I send a mic to. There are a bunch of people in the front row here. Well, go ahead. I mean, just take who, the question, and then you can call okay. a halt when Here's you think the time okay. is up. Hmm. So I would actually be slightly more provocative about it. So Moshe Vardy. The, the, there were various definitions that came up at about the same time, people trying to define what is com computable. But if you look at the lambda calculus, it's, you're not convinced that this captures computability. Even recursive function, you're not convinced that this captures computability. Turing went from, from, from the basics and tried to say, what does it mean to compute? And he models a mathematician that computes. And Gedel, that knew about recursive functions, was not convinced that this is the right definition of, of computability. But when he saw Turing's paper, he says, now I'm convinced. So in retrospect, once we have the equivalence of all this formalism, which is lambda calculus, recursive function, and Turing machine, now we can say they all capture computability. But, uh, but really, the, the convincing account is that of Turing machines. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this I think we're at the end. We're on time. Mm. So let's give this panel a hand. Like a thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And as the panel is stepping off, don't don't step up yet. I just a couple of small announcements. One is uh, there is a sneak preview of a new documentary, Codebreaker, on tomorrow afternoon. I thought it was an undocumented feature, but actually it is in the program. So uh, don't miss that. It's 90 minutes long and quite tremendous. Also, of course, we're going to take up Lambda Calculus again with Dana Scott today at 5 o'clock. So if you didn't get a chance to speak your piece on Lambda Calculus, that will be uh, uh, there. And, and you'll have, I'm sure, long discussions into the evening on it. Um, and so uh, we're going to break. We're going to be back here at 1045 sharp. Uh, and we will all see you then. Thank you.